The following program presents principles designed to promote good health. It should not take the place of personal professional care. Viewers should always consult their qualified health practitioner before considering alternative treatment. looking at these little microorganisms and I want to have a look at their true role in the body which I guess we have touched on they're the they're the players in the cycle of life and when everything's running well in the body they play a very important role in the running of the human body now at the time of Pasteur there was a six times professor his name's Antoine Bouchon and he did not believe as Pasteur did. He did not believe that germs cause disease. He said germs don't cause disease. He said they're the result of unhealthful conditions. And what he did one day, he got a dead cat. He wrapped it in an airtight container and four months later he came back. When he opened the container, he saw dust. We're not surprised, maybe a few bones. What brought cat back to dust? Now in Australia, if some if cat dies in the bush, well the uh, the crows will have a nibble and the dingoes will have a nibble and you know there are vultures that come in and have a nibble and the worms will come up and the dung beetles will come up. This was in an airtight container. So what brought cat back to dust? It was the microorganisms that were an integral part of living running cat, and death of is the organisms is the ultimate self-damage. Basically, the microbes now took off their suit of clothes and put on their rubber gloves and aprons and became the garbage collectors. As the environment changes, the exterminators. As the environment changes, now the undertakers, until eventually, cat is now dust. With great excitement, Antoine Beauchamp put the dust underneath the microscope, it was alive with microorganisms. Remember that law of science? Nothing is created and nothing's destroyed. They performed their role of bringing matter back to dust and now they're in the dust waiting for their next job. You think about it, if it wasn't for these microorganisms, there'd be so much rubbish on the planet, we wouldn't be able to walk on the planet. But they give off some pretty bad fumes, don't they? We can smell it. And what does that bad smell do to us? Remember, we're the doctor. It says, keep away, keep away. It's like I was staying at a house when I was giving meetings in Queensland. And I looked at the little granny flat I was staying with, big open windows, uh, tile floor, nice bed open window. I thought, good, I'll have a good sleep there. After the lecture, I went home, laid down. My, my breath was getting caught. I thought, what is it? And I thought, you know what it's like, just go back to sleep, but I couldn't. So I got up, I took the pillowcase off the pillow, and the pillow was dark yellow and stained. Because where's your face on the pillow? <laughs> you notice when you buy a pillow today, it's got a date on it? You know, some people are sick because of their pillows. That's why we should regularly wash and air our pillows and every pillow should have a pillow protector on it. And maybe you can even make it last past its use by date if you do things like that. That's why the detective hat has to be gone, put on the head. For why are these things so? So with the pillows, I put them up the top of a cupboard, found the little cushion from the lounge, wrapped it in my scarf, put my head down and I went straight <laughs> straight to sleep. That's why you got to listen to that body. So what about these microbes in the dust? Do you know they're waiting for another job? And this is why we put compost into our gardens, isn't it? At home we have three compost bins. One we're adding to, one is sitting, 
while this process takes place. And then the end one, we're digging it up and putting it into our garden. When do you dig it up and put it into your garden? When there's no trace of mould, yeah? It's brought it all back to dust. And you know when it's ready because that's when the pawpaw trees start growing in the compost bin and the pumpkin vines start coming out. Now I put it into my garden. What am I putting into my garden? Let me show you my celery plant. Now my celery plant, I've had these celery plants for a long time, many years. They keep seeding and it, when they go to seed, little ones come up here. The roots underneath take the nutrients out of the soil, but there's something else that allows the roots to get to the nutrients and it's microorganisms. So when I put compost into the soil, I'm putting the microbes into the soil that used to be in the carrot, that used to be in the apple. Remember, it brought it back to dust. You think about an apple tree. An apple tree develops a blossom. Then the blossom develops an apple under the action of microorganisms. The apple is not ready to eat. It has to ripen, and it ripens under the action of the same microorganisms. They just change roles according to the environment. No one eats the apple. What happens to the apple? It rots under the action of the same microorganisms. They just change roles as the environment changes. We do too, don't we? I'm not dressed now the way I'm dressed when I'm digging in my garden. I'm not dressed now the way I'm dressed on my morning walk. I'm not dressed now the way I'm dressed when I go to a wedding. We change roles according to the environment. So do these microbes. Now in the soil, they play another role. In the soil, they break down the minerals and the heavy metals in the soil. In the soil, they also cause the absorption of those minerals up into the plant. In the soil, they protect the plant from harmful microbes that may be in the soil. They nourish the plant. Now this plant, it knows it needs those microbes. So 50% of the fuel that it makes from photosynthesis, it sends back down to the roots to feed the microbes. Beautiful illustration of taking only to give again. The law of service is written on every plant in nature. So this plant makes its fuel from photosynthesis and 50% of that fuel it sends down to the roots to feed the microbes. It's as if the plant's saying, please stay, I'll feed you well. Because that plant knows it needs those microbes for its nourishment and for its protection. Now I'm gonna take this process somewhere you may never have taken it before. When we were in our mother's utero, our gut was sterile, that means no microbes. When we were born, we were literally showered with our mother's microorganisms. Now last year, Catalyst, it's a show that does documentaries in Australia, they did a show called The Gut Reaction. And there was one, obstetrician there and he said I always thought God made a mistake putting the birth canal and the anus so close because when the baby's born you don't want it to have anything like what's coming out of that other <laughs> hole he said I now know it's a perfect design because when the birth canal stretches and the baby's coming out something else stretches it's the anus. And the air coming out of there is laden with the mother's microbes. And when the air hits the baby's face, the baby takes its first breath. <gasps> What's that first breath laden with? <laughs> microbes. Interesting. Do you know they found babies born via caesarean section, their gut is lined with skin microbes? Mm because their first breath is from the skin. But the other good news is that breast milk is laden with microbes. You probably know those first three days, the mother makes colostrum, which is very thick and creamy. And on the third day, then the milk starts to come through. So important that that baby have those first few days. A farmer knows if the cow 
calf doesn't get the, that mother's colostrum, that calf will always be a sickly calf. So those first few days are very, very important. Now, if the mother is unable to breastfeed, if the mother gives birth via caesarean section, my suggestion is that once a day the mother paint her nipple with a probiotic or if she can't breastfeed, do a, give a little probiotic supplement to that baby first thing in the morning because we need that gut flora. That gut flora that acts like a thick turf wall plays a very important role in the body. That gut flora is important for the final breakdown of our food. That gut flora is responsible for the absorption of nutrients out of the gut and into the blood. That thick turf wall is very important in protecting our blood from any harmful microbes that may be in our gut. That thick turf wall feeds these little cells that line our gastrointestinal tract. That's where they play the nourishment role. Hippocrates said, all disease begins in the gut. Now you picture this. Mothers had antibiotics, which kills off some of the good gut flora. Baby's born, now baby has a compromised gut flora. What else compromises gut flora is cortisone, statin drugs, antibiotics, uh, even uh, ibuprofen, neurofen, pain-killing drugs, they all eat away at the gut flora. Babies now born with a compromised gut flora. Babies given altered cow's milk warmed up in a microwave in a plastic bottle. More chemicals coming in. Babies vaccinated. Another blow to the lining of the gut. Four months, baby started to be given food. Hasn't even got teeth. Another misconception. Then the second vaccine comes through. Do you know that's often when the babies go down? One lady said to me, the lights went out in my baby's eyes after the four month vaccination. But some babies don't seem to react. Are they the babies with the strong gut flora? <laughs> are they the babies that are getting all the right environment, the breast milk? Can you see that? And often that vaccine is just the final thread on a whole lot of other little threads. One of the things that's very effective at wiping the gut flora is antibiotics. Look at the name. Anti means against, biotic means life. What are antibiotics? Alexander Fleming, 1929. He's growing bacteria in flasks in his laboratory. He comes in one morning and they're all dead. Now he knew Newton's third law of motion to every action. There is an equal and an opposite reaction. Why is my bacteria dead? He looked in the laboratory, nothing there to indicate that it could have hurt it. He looked outside, no. He looked as the sun came in and he saw a dust coming in his window and he looked for the source in the next story, there was an open window and there was a plate of fruit and there was a mouldy orange. Do you remember it from school days? Now that mouldy orange gives off a dust and in that dust is its spore, but in that dust is a highly toxic gas designed to kill off anything that would compete with the mole's food source. It's almost as if the mole says, this is my orange, no one else is gonna get it. I'm gonna give off a toxic gas to kill anything that might try and get my orange. What might that be? Other bacteria, yeast, fungus. So that dust came in the window, settled on Alexander Fleming's bacteria and killed it. Alexander Fleming called the mould penicillium and he called the mould waste, which is more toxic than the mould, penicillic acid. Now that penicillic acid is the penicillin we know today. Penicillin has saved the lives of millions, granted. But we've got a problem today. It's the overuse of the antibiotic and the inability of the physician to inquire why are these things getting out of control in the body. The human body can cope with about two courses in a lifetime, got that? <clears throat> 
two courses in a lifetime. One lady said, my, said to me, my daughter had 26 courses in the first year of life. Oh, that hurt to hear that. I wonder if that little one's gut will ever recover. There's a big push in medicine today to reduce antibiotic consumption. Have you noticed? I raised eight children without antibiotics and they're all still alive. And some of them had colds, some of them had bronchitis. What would I do? I'd wrap garlic on their feet and put charcoal poultices on their chest and let it take its course. Mm -hmm. And they all recovered. I'm not against antibiotics, but they should only be kept for life saving. And you know what's happening today? When a person's life is threatened, the antibiotics are not working because they've become immune to them because they've had so many. Many are sick through ignorance. We've had many people come to our health retreat with sinus problems. And one lady said, well, every time I start blowing out green, I go to the doctor and he gives me antibiotics. Do you know what that is? Do you know what that green is? It's a knock. What do the antibiotics do? <laughs> Silence it. So if they come to Misty Mountain Health Retreat, I discover, wow, these people have got a gluten and a dairy intolerance, <laughs> causing all that mucus. And then that mucus sits there for a while. What comes along and starts eating it? <laughs> the yeast and the fungus. We had an in nose and throat specialist do our program. She's a specialist nurse. So she assists in ear, nose and throat surgery. She said, you would not believe the green slime we pull out of sinuses. And she said, and every specialist acknowledges that it's fungus. Mm-hmm. So what you've got to do to clean up science is stop what's causing it. We get our guests to start sniffing golden seal powder, cleans it all out. Start giving the body the right conditions and it will heal. It's like one lady, she came to us a few years ago. She was overweight. She had sinus problems. She was on daily headache medication from the pain from her sinuses. I discovered she had a dairy and a wheat intolerance. Gave her the golden seal to sniff out. She came back two years later. She came in and I said, welcome to our health retreat. She said, don't you remember me? I said, I'm trying. <laughs> she said, I've lost 20 kilos. She was about... 38. She looked like a totally different person. The swelling in her face had gone down. She said, I just want to tell you that I have no sinus problem anymore. None. I never take a headache tablet anymore. She said, my mother was so worried about me because I've lost all this weight. She insisted I go to the doctor. The doctor said, that's the best blood slide I've ever seen. <laughs> Everything was working well. Is it that simple? What about irritable bowel syndrome? Well, on these little areas here where there's no gut flora, there are three foods that are like kerosene to a fire when someone has an irritated colon. One is refined sugar, the other is dairy, and the other is wheat. Later in the week, we're gonna be looking at the hybridized wheat. One lady said, but God made wheat good. I said, he did. But the wheat today is not the wheat that God made. It, in the 50s, it was hybridized. And there is a herb. There are actually two herbs that are a little bit slimy and they coat, soothe and heal the lining of the gut. One is aloe vera. And the, and the other one is slippery elm. Slippery elm is the powdered bark of the slippery elm tree. And I've seen people heal very quickly from that. We had a guy from Kenya do our program. He was 40. He had ulcerative colitis. That means the lining of his gut now was ulcerated. He just had a flare-up. He was on cortisone. He was on anti-inflammatories. And his favorite food was bread. <laughs> He didn't have it in Kenya, and when he came to Australia, he'd been living in Australia two years, he, he sort of lived between Kenya and Australia, and when he came to Australia, what do you think he started eating? <laughs> Lots of bread. Whereas in uh, Kenya, they eat ugali, which is cornmeal. 
So, of course, we didn't serve him any bread. He was going to the toilet 10 times a day and he was passing blood. So I put him on slippery elm four times a day. <laughs> First two days of juices, I thought, we'll see how he goes. So on Monday, about 12 o'clock, I said, how are you going? And he was very shy and very quiet. He'd say, good. I said, how many times are you going? Four. That's amazing, on juices. Second day, how are you going? Good. How many times are you going? Four. Wow. And then Wednesday, started eating. How are you going? Good. How many times? Three. <laughs> Which you would understand with food. I said to him, do you know I believe that you can stop your medication? He'd already started to reduce it. Remember, he'd go on it for the flare-up and he'd reduced it. So Thursday, he'd actually stopped the medication now for about, I don't know, 16 hours. How are you going? Good. How many times? Three. <laughs> Amazing. Off his medication, no pain, no more bleeding. Now, if it was you or I, we'd probably be screaming, but he's so shy. <laughs> he just smiled. Every time we looked at him, he was smiling. <laughs> wow, and he'd suffered this for many years. That's quite incredible, isn't it? The other thing we got him to do was take a probiotic. Antibiotic means against life, probiotic means for life. So your probiotic basically are these Lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacteria and you can buy it in little powder forms. Was it that simple? Very simple, isn't it? So how do we get yeast funguses out of our body and how do we know they're there? Well, one way is the tongue. The tongue should be pink. And if there are, there's white at the back of the tongue which can't be scraped off, they're little fungus buds. What are the symptoms of having yeast fungus in your body? How long's a piece of string? <laughs> Do you know, to date, they have tested 1.5 million different yeasts and fungus, and a thousand of those are known to cause disease in mankind. It's the mold waste that is the most toxic, and different mold waste affects different body parts. If you just Google uh, cancer fungus, you will see a whole area come up there. So how do we get it out of the body? Number one, starve it. What's its favourite food? Sugars. <laughs> if we get someone coming to us wanting help with cancer, we even take them off fruit for six weeks. Because this is such an important subject, and I believe so important, and it's almost pivotal, pivotal knowing and managing our health to know the roles that these microbes play. I have written a book on the subject. It's called Self Heal by Design. And I think Amelia, here's Amelia, front row. Amelia's my right hand. I nearly said man, lady. And she has, um, I think she has some on a table out there. And the book goes into detail on how you can do this. And what I have done is I've put in more detail what I've presented today but I have quoted ma many books. I'm acting as a journalist. There are many that have done the research and I certainly quote them. So basically, you've got to stop anything that will feed it. Remember, they're just opportunist organisms. So the more they're fed, the more they'll hang around. Also, one must check the house. I'm sure there's a lot of mould activity in my compost bin, but it's nowhere near my house. There must not be any mould in the house. If there is, you've got to find out why. Never put bleach on mould. You put bleach on mould, you will create one of the most toxic mixtures on the planet and has killed people. So how do we get rid of it? White vinegar. If there's any mould in your house, you put a mask on, put white vinegar in a spray bottle, spray it and leave the room immediately. Come back 15 minutes later and you can wipe it up. If you spray and wipe, the dust comes off, you can, it'll go through your pores of your skin, you can inhale it. <laughs> this is toxic stuff, you gotta keep away from it. And then, when you've wiped it all up, then you get a damp cloth and put something like clove essential oil and wipe that over. And then go to the phone and ring the plumber 
or the builder <laughs> or the man that can clean all the leaves out of your garden. You just got to find out why that why it is there. It should not be there. The house should be clean, dry, airy, let the sun in, keep the fans on. Right at this moment, our health retreat has closed down while I am lecturing here and every room is shut, every window is shut and the fans are on full bore. That's, is that an Aussie saying? Full on. <laughs> so that when we go back next Sunday and open those, um, those, those, those rooms, they will be nice and fresh. So there's no way any yeast or mould can grow in them because we live in a rainforest <laughs> and we don't keep those wind. If we're in those rooms, the windows are wide open, but when no one's there, so when you go away, you've got to shut everything up and have the fans on. Fan do not take up much, much electricity. Number two, you've got to kill this fungus. I think we've got to get away from the kill mentality, but there are herbs that will kill fungus and won't kill you. One is garlic, another is olive leaf extract. Portiaco is a South American herb. In my book, I list all of the different essential oils and herbs that can kill fungus. Number three, we're going to bring back the balance. Flood the gastrointestinal tract with the good guys, which is a probiotic. And number four is alkalis. The most alkaline foods you can take into your body are the vegetables. And of the vegetable kingdom, the most alkaline is greens. So green barley, spirulina. I met a man in America who had cured his cancer by just taking green barley four times a day. <laughs> you see, cancer loves an acid environment. Mold loves an acid environment. <laughs> And you've got to get the sunshine into your house, get the sunshine into your body, on your body. And number five is all mist. You put this into the web, you'll get a whole spiel on it. It's orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements. So it's a mineral supplement and there are minerals in a monoatomic form. And this monoatomic form, research in America is showing it can heal DNA damage. So here we are healing the DNA damage. In my book, I have a chapter on genetics and the last page of that chapter, I explain the Ormis, but basically it's a mineral supplement. It's been dropped out of seawater and it's minerals in a monoatomic form, healing the DNA damage. The human body will heal itself if you give it the right conditions. And these are the conditions that the body needs to be able to get rid of any build-up yeast or fungus that may be in the body. We've had some very remarkable turnarounds from cancer at our health retreat. We had one man come, I think it was two years ago now. He was Lebanese. He and his family own a huge strawberry farm in Melbourne, right down the bottom of Australia. He did not really want to come to our health retreat, but his wife and his daughter were very keen. His daughter was about 30. So he did the whole program and we did some specific treatments helping to alkalize, gave him the herbs. He heard all the lectures and he sort of half listened. And then he went home and he rang me up four months later, very excited. He had prostate cancer. He said, I've just been to the doctor and tested and I'm clear. Now he's interested. <laughs> He was very blessed to have a wife and a daughter because when he went home, they just did it. They made the food. I know what my husband's like. He's so busy all day that whatever I give him, he'll eat. <laughs> Maybe not too much garlic. Um, so that's why it's good to, to win over the, the cook in the home. And I do know some men cook, but my husband's not interested at all in cooking. But I don't mind because I love cooking. When you give the body the right conditions, healing takes place. That's the good news. I believe God meant it to be simple, and I'm so glad it is simple. Now, before we close, I do have time just for a couple of questions. Does anyone have a question? 
The other thing too I will say about questions is where from tomorrow on we're going to have a question box. And so if you do have a question, oh, what a fantastic team that is here. They've already got it. Okay, if you go outside the format uh, for you, there is a small silver box with a little top. So any questions, please pop it in. There's a question there. What's the difference between sanitation and hygiene? I guess uh, they're very similar, but hygiene probably is more in the food department. And Florence Nightingale, she said that in that hospital, the men were getting, the food was big saucepans of water with bits of rotten meat in it. So we needed a bit of hygiene in the kitchen, hygiene like everything was clean. And I guess sanitation is more applying to um, in the house, uh, the bathrooms, the, the, the area. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> there was another question, yes? Yeah, stevia is a natural sweetener. We used to have a plant stevia, and after a meal, my children would, my grandchildren would say, Nana, Nana, can we have a sweet leaf? I don't know if you've ever tasted a stevia leaf. It's incredibly sweet. And you can buy it as a powder, and it is something like 20 times stronger than sugar. You only need the tiniest little bit. So the question is, stevia is an excellent sweetener. Some people say, I don't like stevia, it's bitter. That's because they've used too much. It, it's unbelievable how little that you need. So it is an excellent option, yes. I've got time for just one more question. Yes? Meat or night? Meat. Yes, I will be covering that later in the week. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the China study. Dr. Colin Campbell wrote an excellent book to the China study and he shows very clearly in there that when meat breaks down, it creates a very acid environment in the body and can feed cancer cells. He said that he could switch cancer on and off like a switch in his research, depending how much meat and meat products that the, because he was doing it on rats. And the book's called The China Study because in China, there is an excellent ground for research because all the country Chinese are reading traditionally and all the city Chinese are reading what Time magazine called the meat sweet diet, which is high sugar, high meat, and how the country Chinese cancer hardly known of, and yet the city Chinese, the cancer rates are up to the Western countries. So thank you for your attention tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Um, do you know tomorrow night's meeting? Okay, tomorrow night is diabetes. Now, tonight we'll be looking a little bit more detail at food. So if you have diabetes, this is an excellent meeting for you. If you don't have diabetes, this is an excellent meeting for you because you will never get diabetes. And the good news is it's totally conquerable. So I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. Now, before we close, please bow your heads and I'll say a prayer in closing. Thank you, Father in heaven, for such fantastic information about this amazing body that we live in. I pray that every head bowed will be inspired to look at their body a little differently and make steps to treat it well. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night.